everybody. Actually, um, that photograph of me going like this was taken here in Istanbul, actually. So I owe you guys very much for that, uh, especially for the nightclub at 2 o'clock in the morning in which the photograph was taken. Um, now, these are my contact details if you want to reach out to me. Uh, if we have drinks in the bar, you can try and become my Facebook friend, but otherwise don't bother. Um, also, you won't be able to anyway, because I think I've run out of friends. I mean, slots. Too many. Too many friends. Um, and you can try email me as well, if you want to. The best way to email people, by the way, once you've um, met them at a conference, is not to pitch your company in the subject line, but to give the person context for where you met them. One of the big problems is that people meet lots of people these days, don't they? because of social networking. I mean, I don't know about you, but my social life is amazing. Now, um, but uh, nobody can remember anybody. Nobody can remember anybody. And there's a thing called the Dunbar's number, which was invented that you can only remember about 100 people in context. So if you um, meet somebody out of context, you won't know who they are. Very simple, because that's where you work, up there. So. Um, now, <clears throat> I had a couple of ideas for speeches today, uh, and I sent the organizers a shopping list of speeches that I could give. And I said, I can talk about how startups can work with technology journalists and uh, get on TechCrunch, maybe, eventually. I can uh, do a speech about uh, the future of artificial intelligence. Hello, Mr. Cameraman. Um, I can do a speech on um, the blockchain and I can do a speech on how <coughs> the cryptocurrency market is going to start threatening or uh, competing with or even merging with the venture capital world for startups. And, uh, and I thought this was the most boring speech that I could give you. I thought they were, they're not, not going to cho choose that one. Everybody who wants to know, always wants to know how to get on TechCrunch, of course, right? Obviously, but no. You know what they did? They chose the one that's really boring. Okay? So are you ready? I'm joking. It's not that boring. But it's, it's boring. It's, it's, it's technical, shall we say. So we're going to have to work through this. You ready? You're going to work with me on it? With me? Go, come with me on a journey into the cryptocurrency world. It's like, do you want the red pill or the blue pill? Do you want the crypto or the normal cash? Um, it is very interesting, isn't it, how much money is being raised on the ICO market. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I shall give you a 30-second lesson, which is that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin came along, and as in the first law of thermodynamics, where heat is work and work is heat. Okay, everyone repeat after me. Heat is work and work is heat. Marvellous. Good. Well done, class. Well done. You're, sort of for, you're surviving your first physics lesson. The second law of thermodynamics is that heat cannot of itself pass from one body to a hotter body, but we'll leave that for another lesson. The first law means that if work is heat and heat is work, it means that when you go and mine gold, then you are working and you are creating heat, and that is in the universe. But when you go and mine Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, you are also using energy, right? And as a result of that, this is why cryptocurrencies have become as big as they are, because they require work. They require heat and work to actually exist. And that's why previous virtual currencies meant nothing, because they didn't require any work. You could just invent them like pieces of paper on a photocopier. And that's why cryptocurrencies are significant. And so because of the, uh, the invention, firstly, of Bitcoin and the blockchain, more significantly, the blockchain, because the blockchain really is the most disruptive aspect of this. So the blockchain being a universal ledger where anything can be recorded for all time and every piece of history about something that you want to record on the blockchain will be carried forever in perpetuity, in forever. And in fact, you can also put things into the future on the blockchain. So that, for instance, 
if I uh, want to bequeath my enormous wealth to my uh, grandchildren or my great-grandchildren, uh, then I can put it, you know, 50, 100 years hence onto the blockchain, and at that point, ding, somebody gets lots of money in their bank account. So it's very interesting, isn't it? So now, because of the invention of the blockchain, we then had the invention of Ethereum. And Ethereum was basically a much more sophisticated version of Bitcoin, but required, uh, but allowed for this thing called smart contracts. So what, in effect, if you want to call it, it's programmable money, okay? It's programmable and it's, it can become a contract as well as a currency. So that is my two minute download on all of this stuff. And what we're gonna talk about now is about um, the, 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 the new wave of so-called ICOs. So ICOs being initial coin, coin offerings. Now, we all know what an IPO is, don't we? When an IPO, when a tech company IPOs on the stock market. But an ICO is when you can buy into a platform using cryptocurrencies like Ethereum or the Ether on the Ethereum platform. And you, uh, yeah, it's like, an I it's like an IPO, but it's on the blockchain. Now, what's happening is it's being split now between private ICOs and public. So private ICOs are where you go to uh, a select number of people and you'll give them a good price on the offering, <coughs> better than a public one, because they are significant investors. And so what's happening is, is um, the real world of technology and investing is starting to get involved in this world. So, um, where shall I point this at? That? So, a lot of people are saying, hold on a second, this is the future. This, ladies and gentlemen, is our Shangri-La. Why do we need VCs anymore? Why do we need angel investors when we can just ICO? And we can raise for an, from the whole planet, all seven billion people of us, if eventually we uh, are all of us, all humankind is using cryptocurrencies, will be able to invest in a company. Can you imagine? That'd be rather cool, wouldn't it? <clears throat> You're sitting somewhere in your back bedroom in, uh, Ita in Istanbul, and you've had a great idea, and you want to raise money, you don't need to get on a plane to Silicon Valley or to London or Berlin or wherever. You just create an ICO and all of a sudden you are a millionaire. Hands up who would like to do that. Oh, really? Oh, you are so easy to fool, you people. Now, do you really think it's that easy? Well, it might be, actually. Because there is a, there is a huge... Oh, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Sorry, I'm busy. Um, sorry, Mark, I'm busy. Um, now, it, it might seem like a good idea. You know, it's happening. You know, and also, interestingly, don't tell anybody, right? Just between you and me. But you can ICO and convert that into fiat currencies via exchanges. So people are becoming paper millionaires via ICOs and converting some of that wealth into real money. Very interesting. But if you're a startup and you want to build a technology platform, you have to work out, is this actually worthwhile? Let's, let's sort of think about this. Now, I'm going to apologize because I've only really written, only really just written this speech in the last couple of weeks, and I haven't really put lots of pretty pictures on it yet. But, but just imagine pretty pictures, OK? Cats, dogs, dolphins, okay. So what are ICOs? Well, they are equity through coin offerings. They are smart contracts with or without a tradable token. A token is what you, you get when you participate in an ICO. Think of it almost like it's either a security, an asset. It's almost in the tech world, I kind of almost like a getting access to an API. It's almost like buying into an API key. Um, and cryptocurrency as coin token sales. So it's, it, as I said earlier, it's um, 
it allows you to access the platform because you're buying into the platform and you're buying their token. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Well, did you have a nice lunch? Some sandwich. Good. Um, now, token sales or swaps uh, make a transaction more efficient. All of this stuff is happening almost automatically. It's wonderful. Uh, the lawyers are getting very upset. Because you don't need lawyers in this world nearly as much, right? Um, you might need lawyers to work out whether or not what you're doing is legal. Uh, and in, certainly in the US, for instance, the uh, 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 SEC uh, has some very stringent issue, uh, issues to do with cryptocurrencies. And, um, and a it's putting off a lot of Americans. That means it's more for us, everyone. No. Um, hello, America. We love you. Right. Now, so what's a bit, a bit of background on this? Well, the total amount raised this year with ICOs is higher than any early stage traditional VC investment. We're talking on paper, as at least, digital paper, if you want to call it that, billions and billions of dollars. Um, so what's the model? Well, you appeal directly to a fan base with ICO. You get all your fans, friends, family, and everyone else. Um, you emit tokens as a cryptocurrency, as a token sale or swap, or as equity, right? Is this actually pointing in the right? Am I, which one is it? This one? Right. It's like being Star Trek. Um, so what are ICOs good for right now? Let's do the good, the bad, mad, and the ugly of ICOs. So what are the good? The good are this. So you have a subscription-based business with low marginal costs will go to, its to, to tokens for fundraising. So uh, you have a low marginal cost, you can do an ICO. Um, they're also good for, oops, community hubs based around economic activity. If you're doing an ICO, people are buying into your platform. Oh, God, man. Jeez. Hold on, I missed one. And you also, yeah, um, immediate investor liquidity. Forget waiting for 10 years for that startup that you invested in to um, exit, IPO, get sold. Once you've, uh, the price has been struck and your IPO has popped, your ICO has popped, and the public markets have got involved, you can sell part of your stake, or all of it if you want to, within an hour of the ICO. That is transformational for fundraising and transformational for investors. And this is why I think it's going to have, start to have a significant effect on how you raise money for a startup. Have you guys just added to my time? Because that's a long time. We'll have to do some Q&A. So what's the bad? Right, scam artists. Lots of scam artists. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that we are dealing in a completely unregulated world. There are no nice regulators out there looking after you, making sure you're not being scammed. There is, there is no regulator, right? So it's buyer beware, okay? So uh, there are scam artists. There are even people who are not just simply, uh, you know, your traditional scam artist who likes to, you know, rob people a little bit. Uh, but there is organized crime involved in some of these ICOs. Uh, there is the mafia. There is money laundering. It's not great. <laughs> Good luck. So um, it's very difficult to work out what's going on. And so I wake up every day on, and open my uh, email, my email inbox <laughs> for TechCrunch. And I get, uh, there's a lot of people trying to get uh, people uh, in the media like me to write about their ICO. Well, I don't know who these people are. Do you? And uh, what the hell is this platform anyway? Um, and so there's a lot of that going on at the moment. Uh, a lot of Facebook messengers popping in going, can you write about my ICO? I'm like, no. Who the hell are you? And so there's some strange stuff going on.
So buyer beware, remember? Um, Ponzi schemes, <coughs> unless the created tokens have an actual use. Now, this is where it gets interesting because there are some really genuinely interesting and fascinating projects on the blockchain, on the blockchain community. If you think back, as I'm sure you could, to the birth of the internet in the uh, mid-19, uh, well, the birth of the internet industry, shall we say, early to mid-90s, um, uh, there was a, a lot of the biggest internet plays back in the day were all about infrastructure, web servers, switches, those kinds of things. That's what's going on in the blockchain world right now, is infrastructure. So the more important blockchain platforms that, are building, platforms that have been built on the blockchain, or whether they've been Ethereum or whatever blockchain, private blockchains, you name it, are infrastructure plays. They are fixing the problems with how the blockchain might work and how cryptocurrencies might be worked, uh, or traded or traded as assets, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that infrastructure is being built right now. And the most interesting companies involved in that space are doing infrastructure plays. They're not doing, you know, uh, you know, uh, Airbnb, but on the blockchain. They're doing infrastructure. Uh, so beware of that. Now, <coughs> it gets worse. I think you might be standing in front, excuse me, sir, could you stand that way? Because you're standing in front of my laptop that I'm pointing at. Yeah, thanks. Otherwise, because I don't want to hurt you, this might, you know, it might hurt him. Oh, I could do this. Hold on a sec. Oh, I got this. Oh, I got my. Oh, I could. I could kill someone with this laser. Look, look. Don't look. At, don't look at the laser. It's a shame we can't all be kids still. Right. Some are related to an. Did I do this right? Yeah. Oh yeah, the ugly. Right. Some are related to an IPO. Most get private funding. Then they go public with an ICO. There may be pr private and IPO. So what's happening is that this private aspect, private sale aspect, the before the public ICO is becoming I interesting and significant. Um, but so basically, but the trouble is nobody can decide what to do. They can't, nobody can decide the private, the public, what do they do? Do they go straight out there? Do they, do they know enough people to have a private ICO? It's basically a mess. You're looking at a wild west era. It's very, very fascinating to watch. And having uh, seen the industry grow myself, it's really fascinating to see how it's, how it's changing so quickly, uh, this new industry. So the question is, will ICOs replace traditional advertising? Will we, ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, wake up in the morning in Istanbul and go, I need to raise some money. Let's go and do an ICO. Easy. Boom. Why would I even bother calling up a traditional investor? Right? Will it replace that? So let's work that out. So here's the case for yes, it will. Right? When you are choosing your investors, what do you basis do you choose them on? You choose them for cash, actual cash, so you can pay for things. Their reputation, quite important their network and their experience. These are the things that, these are the basis on which many people choose investors, right? So, if you apply that to an ICO context, if experience, network, reputation is irrelevant, then an ICO makes lots of sense. If you don't need any of those things, if you have an existing network of investors or advisors, or just you know friends, frankly, who can help you, then you and you all you want is pure cash, then an ICO makes a lot of sense, right? Um, here's the case for no, or it might even be a blend of the two. I think this thing needs new batteries. Um, an ICO is not the new venture capital; it's the new Kickstarter, ladies and gentlemen. We know what that is, don't we? Um, it's the new crowdfunding. So if, if, you, if the crowdfunding world is you know, where you are going and you want to raise maybe a small amount of money for something, then maybe this is the new crowd Kickstarter. It's not actually real 
um, venture capital investment, it's more like crowdfunding, which is a different kind of thing altogether. Oh, thank you. So we see if this one works. It's definitely very cool. I think it could be like a gun or something. Try that. Okay, right. Oh, hello. I think it does work. So funding for for um, uh, for DAO projects, distributed uh, organisations, distributed autonomous organisations, uh, projects that wouldn't get funded anyway. So things that which wouldn't actually get any real money anyway, but look good on paper. BS stands for bullshit, right? Then that, that's great for ICOs. There's a lot of bullshit ICOs, believe you me. It's also hard to trace these funds. So anti-money laundering rules um, do not apply. We've got a lot of problems with um, a lot of these things uh, because it's hard to trace where the funds are coming from, where they're going to, where they end up, and all of those problems as well. So here's the answer. Then ICOs won't replace traditional venture capital, but will change the structure of investments. So let's look at the structure. Let's think about the structure of how uh, investments are done in this n potential new world. Because the main question is, is, you know, if they're going to have an effect at all, do they have an effect at the early stage when you are trying to raise uh, money, the late stage? When you are trying to get, when, when investors want liquidity, which level does it happen at? Well, the ISO doesn't tr replace traditional investing, but fast liquidity changes the game. In other words, because you can cash out fast, that's what the reason. Oops, a Daisy. I'm just getting far too enthusiastic, you see, as you can tell. Um, that's, what, that's what changes the game. In the, in the end, the liquidity is what changes the game, not the fact that ICOs exist at all. It's because of the speed at which they move, right? So Series A or B funding stage may see more ICO activity rather than early stage because early stage is, is not the, the tricky one to catch. It's the to, to, to crack. It's the latest stage funding, especially in Europe, when you really do want to have um, later stage funding, which is often quite hard to raise in Europe. And also, it becomes much more attractive to traditional investors because their liquidity event happens so quickly, right? Um, it, the other thing that it really potentially affects a lot, in it, which is kind of exciting, if you like things like science, is that research and development, academic projects which need funding, are also very attractive uh, pl uh, places to, cr to create ICOs because it's a way of raising global money rather than local. <clears throat> now, does an ICO affect seed funding? Well, it, not necessarily because seed requires too much trust. When you want to do early stage, uh, when you raise money from an early stage investor, what's the thing that matters most? It's their experience, their network, the people that they work with, how the, the doors that they can open for you. It's much more about people. One of the great lies about the technology industry is that it's about technology. You know what? It's about people. It's about who you deal with, the trust, is, the trust networks you form, the people you put trust in and the people who trust you. At the early stage, when you can look in the whites of their eyes and say, is it working or not? That's when it works at the early stage. So seed investing matters less in the cryptocurrency run, uh, right, uh, world as it does later on. So the other thing that's going on is that venture capital appears to be disrupting ICOs rather than the other way around. Why is that? It's because they're getting involved. Most money is now in pre-sales due to traditional investor demand. Traditional investors who want to play on the new world of the blockchain uh, are investing in these pre-ICO sales. They get preferential terms. They get um, a better pricing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also get access to liquidity faster. So uh, 
and that it also validates the ICO. So as a journalist, when I want to cover an ICO, the first question I ask is, who are the investors in the pre-sale? Who are the pre-sale investors? Because if you have legitimate investors involved in that early private sale, it's more likely you're going to get coverage for your uh, project. Uh, because uh, a traditional investor is risking their reputation in this, in this pre-sale. So therefore, that, requires, that creates third-party validation for what you're doing. Um, now, smart companies do precede seeds to get the product market fit, right? And then an ICO in place of an A or B round. This is safer for investors, it's safer for the, for the startup, it's safer for the, for, the, for the project already. The question is, can you actually attract traditional investors to your ICO? That's the question, right? That's up to you. So what happens is the ICOs end up being split into two. Securities and not securities. Projects for the technology world, for uh, tokens that engineers can, can use to build things on your platform, and the security world, which is where, uh, where the token is actually treated like an actual security. And that's when the legal minefields can begin. So here's an example. Blue Yard investors in Berlin invested in a blockchain-based business by taking equity, but also investing in the tokens on their ICO. So thus, they benefit directly from the success of their investment and via more traditional means. So that's rather interesting. So it means that traditional investors aren't just investing in the ICO. They're also taking uh, traditional equity uh, for cash, for traditional cash in the company. Now, there's a problem here, which is that many ICOs are subscribed in large part by institutional investors who take a spray and pray approach. So they're just going like, yes, 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 boom, boom, and wait, wait for one of them to do well, um, which creates, as I said, a lot more problems, um, craziness. And there's a lot of, another one called regulation. Remember regulation? China's banned ICOs, supposedly. Russia, supposedly, there's a possible ban coming or is about to happen. And then, then the other day, they thought, oh, you know what? We'll create the crypto ruble. How many of us would invest in the crypto ruble? Hmm. Ah, one. Well done, sir. Are you, is your name Vladimir? <laughs> no. Um, no. Uh, why are they doing that, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the very simple answer is because they want to control it, right? They want to control cryptocurrencies. So what's the best way of them playing in this game? Issue their own coin. And that, and that will be very interesting to watch as well. Um, and in the Ukraine, for instance, there's even potential ways, uh, thoughts about legalizing ICOs. So some jurisdictions like Switzerland, Singapore, uh, Canada, are looking at how, they're gonna, how can they actually give this real legitimate regulation and they can benefit from all this brand new world that's, that's been created. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of a traditional British finish. Marvellous. Keep calm because it's the conclusion coming. Uh, for professional tech investors, ICOs could be a powerful new tool. Powerful. Um, if you are a professional, if you are an amateur, uh, you are in, you're potentially in big trouble and you might lose a lot of money, right? And it's also in a very complex, complex world. This man is taking a photograph of my shoes. Okay. Okay. It's pretty complex. So don't get involved if you are any way feel that uh, this, it's a little bit bamboozling. Uh, you have to be a professional to be involved in, in this world, then, but certainly a professional investor, I think. But for certain, it's a massive technological shift that will disrupt and reduce the cost of transactions currently done by banks and the financial industry. And who doesn't want to stick it to the banks, right? Don't we? Yeah? And not, sorry, bankers. We just, we just hate you because you just keep moving the money around. It's our money, right? So... Um, that would be cool, and it'll be, see, it'll be fascinating to see how it all plays out. But ladies and gentlemen, we do know that one thing is certain, is that there are exciting times ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs>